you'll open your New Testament to 1 Peter 3, we'll read the last part of verse 18 through the end of the chapter. Well, we'll just read all of 18 and just read through the end. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened or made alive by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. The like figure one to baptism doth also nice now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject, subject unto him. In 1848, a Nashville preacher by the name of Jesse Babcock Ferguson took over a magazine called the Christian Review. That magazine was at that time edited by Talbert Fanning. Talbert Fanning is best known in the Florence, Alabama area for Mars Hill School. Talbert Fanning stood six feet, six inches tall. He wore clothes made for him by his mother and she always made the britches too short. And a lady told him one time when she first heard, heard him first preach, she said, you'll never make a good preacher. He said, why? She said, your feet go too far through your britches. Well, he did make a great preacher. After he left the Christian Review, Fanning took over the Gospel Advocate along with William Lipscomb, or started the Gospel Advocate in 1855 along with William Lipscomb. William, they gave way to David Lipscomb eventually and, they, and Fanning and he were co-editors. But after Ferguson bought the Christian Review from Tower Fanning, he began to, first of all, he changed his name to Christian Magazine. And he began to write about this passage of scripture we just read. When Brother West wrote about Jesse Babcock Ferguson, he wrote that Ferguson was both eloquent and brilliant, and he knew it. This is a very arrogant young man, not humble at all. West added, flattery fell abundantly upon his head and he grew, grew vain and proud, losing at the same time his spirituality. There's been something going around among us lately called the new heaven and new earth idea that we'll just be here for eternity. And the men I've met who are a part of that thing are just like Jesse Babcock Ferguson, very arrogant and that kind of thing. Ferguson wrote that the language here conveys the idea that Christ preached to the spirits of the invisible world. That is, he entered the Hadean realm and preached the gospel to them. Eventually, he took the idea that the gospel was for the dead also, a kind of second chance gospel. Alexander Campbell in the Millennial Harbinger immediately responded to Ferguson. He called his error, Ferguson's error, a posthumous gospel. Jesse Babcock Ferguson left the church, went into spiritualism, and eventually went into atheism. What I want to do is look at 1 Peter 3 here in what it says and help us understand that there's no such thing as a second chance gospel. First of all, everybody in hell is a believer in God. Yes or no? 
Is that right? Can I get an amen? No? Everybody in hell is a believer. Yeah. Just ask the rich man, Acts, uh, uh, Luke 16. But they're lost forever. Yes or no? Let's read Matthew 25, 30, 46 before we get any further into this study tonight and assure ourselves that this place they're going has no escape. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. I don't know what you think everlasting means, but to me that's eternal. And when it's eternal, there's no beginning, no end. It's just forever. And I cannot imagine anyone knowing that there's a way to escape this place would not want to escape it. I've heard people say, and they've actually said it to me, well, I want to go there because all my friends are there. Nobody has any friends there. Everybody there hates you. It's a place of hate. In fact, nobody cares that you're there. The Lord said, go away. And so, why would anyone teach that the Lord went there to preach the gospel. Let's look at the very first words of 319 here. By which. That's a reference to the last word in verse 18. Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. Christ was quickened or made alive by the Holy Spirit. By which? The Holy Spirit. He, Christ, We'll have to ask ourselves how he went by the Holy Spirit. Now, in the original language, there are definite articles in front of the word spirit, and God, and Christ, and so on. So it actually reads, but quickened by the Spirit, that's right, by which also the he went and preached unto no, no the in front of these spirits. They're not holy in prison. Know very carefully here. There are, is a one-time definite action that he did. Verse 18 says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. Well, sometime in the past, by the Holy Spirit, he preached to pr spirits that are in prison. This one-time action of the Christ was to a people who, when Peter wrote this, were in prison. Where? They were in a prison called torment. And they're not there when Jesus goes to preach them. They're there when he writes this. Jesus somehow preached to some spirits who, spirits who were then in prison when Peter wrote. When did these spirits who are in prison live, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. Let's go to Acts 8 a moment and notice something very important. We know when these folks lived and that they were preached to. They lived when Noah lived. But when Peter wrote, they were in prison. Not a good place to be in prison. That is torment. This is a wonderful account of a man named Philip who went down to Samaria and preached Christ unto these people, Acts 8, 5. And while he was there, he had a great gospel meeting. I mean, they were baptizing men and women, having a wonderful uh, time, and all of a sudden he's told to leave this tremendous gospel meeting and he's told by an angel there's a fellow riding in a chariot over here you go to him now Philip might have said to that angel look I've got a great thing going here but he did not he went immediately verse 26 the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip you know why didn't Philip tell that angel look you go tell him I'm busy 
I've got a great meeting going on here. No. And he arose and went. It's the minute the angel told him, he went. And he meets an Ethiopian eunuch. And he, see, or he sees this fellow riding in the chariot. And then the Spirit says to him, verse 29, Go near and join yourself to the chariot. The angel told him to go. The Spirit told him to go. Why didn't he just say, you two go? you got more time to do this than I do. Wouldn't it be great to hear the gospel from the Holy Spirit? Folks, deity doesn't preach to us. This particular command was given to men. Men are to go and teach. The Godhead doesn't do that. Neither do angels. In fact, if an angel preached the end of the gospel, you know where he's going. Galatians 1, 8 through 9. Well, if the Godhead doesn't preach now, it didn't preach in Noah's day. But somehow the Lord preached to those people with the message of the Holy Spirit. I'm wondering how that was done. I think I know because Peter told us. Look at 2 Peter 2, 4. We got to have a preacher here. We can't have the Holy Spirit and the Christ speaking directly to these folks. For God spared not the angels of sin, but cast them down to Tartarus, torment, and delivered them. And you know, it's sad that an angel doesn't have a savior. You ever think about that? He preached and, uh, and delivered them in chains of darkness to be reserved under judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah. What's your Bible say? The eighth person, a preacher of justification, righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. How long did Noah preach? This message delivered from the Christ and the Holy Spirit to these who were disobedient when Noah waited in that time when the ark was preparing. How long did Noah preach, folks? Who knows? 120 years, I wouldn't hire him. He only had seven converts. Isn't that how we measure preachers? By how many people come forward? Pardon? Yeah, and one of them fell away. <laughs> That's right. Well, we could ham it up tonight, but I'm not going to. <laughs> oh, me. You know, preachers shouldn't eat ham. Cannibalism is against the law. Yeah, that's all right. Well, let's see. Let's get to, I'm on James here. I need to turn over to First Peter. Now watch. One time in the past, in the time when the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, 120 years, while the ark was a preparing that's when Noah preached this message of the Holy Spirit in Christ, warning those people that a flood was coming. The American Standard Version at 20 verse, verse 20 there reads, that a time, he's telling you when these people lived, a time were disobedient when the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing. The spirits who were then in prison when Peter wrote were disobedient in a time when Noah preached. But to say that this is a second chance gospel misses the point of the whole text. He's trying to show us that when you listen to God's message preached by a faithful preacher, you should obey it. Look what happened to those who did not. And Peter's writing to people who are being put to death for being Christians. And yet he's going to tell them, and there's a whole long list of these things in chapter 4, of how they should have a proper perspective even though they're facing death. Because eventually they're going to be saved the way those eight souls were by water, which is a figurative idea of baptism. The light figure saved by water. Water is how we enter the kingdom, through a burial in it. The like figure unto even baptism doth also now save us. 
Now he's telling us the water doesn't do that. I remember spending about 45 minutes at Lake Forest teaching on the baptism, uh, visiting a lady who was a Baptist, wrote in her notes, her friend told me this, she said, the Church of Christ believes in water salvation. Now she was taught that by her preacher, of course. I don't believe in water salvation. Nothing magical about that water. In fact, I baptized a fellow one time in a baptistry that had a dead bird floating in it. It's not the water, folks. And the plan of salvation didn't die on the cross for you either. Your, self, your obedience puts you in the place where Christ saves you. Are we ever going to get that? Let's get 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. Where? Where, Paul? In him. The faith, the gospel system is located in Christ, no place else. Galatians 3, 26, for all the children of God by faith. Where is it located, Paul? In Christ Jesus. For as many of us as were baptized, you can't faith into Christ. But you can be baptized into Christ, and when you're baptized into Christ, you're in the place where God can justify you. And he can't justify you outside of Christ. And he couldn't save these folks outside of the ark. If they weren't in the ark, they're not saved. They're going to drown. They're going to die. And that figure is the same for us. When we're outside of the ark of safety, we're going to drown in sin. And the ark of safety is Christ, his church. And what we do here is we give the proper answer toward God based on our belief in the resurrection of Christ. When I was baptized, I wasn't just immersed, I was raised so that I could walk after a new kind of situation the way he did when he came out of the tomb. I'm imitating, emulating all of that. And so when I'm baptized, what happens is as God puts me into Christ, into the church, takes away my past sins, justifies me. But my obedience is not the source of that. My obedience simply puts me into the place where the source can justify me. I did nothing to contribute to the cross. It's all His work. And I don't contribute to that part of it. I simply obey, and he does the rest for me. And so I am trying to get the point across tonight. The plan of salvation didn't die on the cross for us. And that's what's wrong with people who don't understand what baptism is all about. Because when you're taught incorrectly, you cannot be baptized correctly. Look at Acts 19 with me for a minute, and I'll go over that point. When you're taught incorrectly, it is impossible to be baptized correctly. You have to understand something when you're being baptized. It came to pass that Paul, uh, uh, well, Apollos was at Corinth. Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, he said, Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? He said, We haven't heard whether there be any Holy Spirit. He said, Under what then were you baptized? Something wrong with your baptism, you weren't taught correctly. And they said, Under John's baptism. John taught what Baptist preachers still teach today. John taught the Jews of his day, Repent and believe God. No, repent and believe in the Christ to come. Why was he talking to the people that way? They were already in covenant relationship with God. They were Jews. They were already believers in that sense. So he told them, repent toward the law of Moses, and you believe in the Christ to come. And then he baptized them for the remission of their sins. And when, they were, when the church started, they were added to it immediately upon their faithfulness. And so he said, John taught you this, but that's not right today. 
You can't repent today before you believe, but I want every one of you to check out every Baptist preacher you've ever heard and listen to him give the invitation. He will tell the people, repent and believe. Why? Because he believes that the moment you think in your heart that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, I mean your mind, the minute you think that, you're saved. So if I teach you your, the minute you think it, you're saved, what do I have to tell you to do before you're saved? Repent. They got it backward. They're teaching John's baptism. Every one of them. And, J and Paul says, that's not the correct teaching. That's not going to help you any. Look at Romans 6 with me a minute. Romans 6, the like figure unto baptism doth also his name. How? It's the act in which God places us in Christ. And Paul said there's something very important about that act that we need to know. We didn't know, we didn't know why we're doing it. You have to obey from the heart the pattern of teaching delivered you. In 1991, I had a public discussion with a preacher named Rubel Shelley. Rubel said that it didn't matter what you understood as long as you were immersed. Let's read what Paul said. Verse 17, or verse 16, Romans 6. Know you not? That to whom you yield yourselves bond slaves to obey, his bond slaves you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto justification. But God be thanked, you were the servants of sin. Watch this now, but you have obeyed from the heart. In other words, from the mind, you understood exactly why you were being baptized. You obeyed a pattern of teaching, a form of doctrine. I don't know if any of you young ladies are, remember what a dress form is. Is there anybody here old enough to remember what a dress form is? Edwin, don't admit that. <laughs> I saw one in my grandmother's house. It, it's just like a torso thing, no head. Or, and they made a dress on it, right? That's what he, the word he uses here, a form of teaching, a pattern. What was the pattern that was delivered them? If you only have a few minutes with someone, use this passage right here. And show them they have to obey a form of teaching delivered them. And if you'll run over to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, you'll find out what was delivered them. It's the same thing Paul obeyed. It's the same thing the Corinthians obeyed. They obeyed the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's the pattern of teaching. That was delivered. That was taught to them. They were buried with him. Verses 3 and 4, verse chapter 6 right there. And so in just a few minutes I can show someone. When you obey that baptism, that uh, uh, command to be baptized, you're emulating the death, burial, and resurrection. And until then, you're not in Christ. Now, anyone, anyone who denies the necessity for baptism is denying the necessity for the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. No sense in that either. But you cannot be taught incorrectly about this. You have to believe first. Then, and only then, are you in a position to repent. And I tell the students all the time, if I ever hear them say that repentance is when you turn to God, I'm going to jump up out of my seat, run up, and take away their diploma. No, repentance. I can't hear you, so you'll have to... Which statement's that? Yeah, I'm a dead man. What's repentance, folks? It's a mental decision. You make it up here. When, you're a be when you say, I believe that he is the Christ, the Son, I believe he's deity. I believe that. You have to make a decision. There are two reasons you should make it. You should know how much you've been grieving God by your sin. 2 Corinthians 7, 10. Godly sorrow causes this thing to take place. And you should think about his goodness. The goodness of God leads you to repentance. And so I've hurt God by my sin. And I haven't been thinking about his love. I've got to make a decision here. 
I've got to say, Keith, stop hurting God with your sin and think about his love. Now I'm ready to do something. I'm ready to turn, which follows repentance. Acts 3.19, repent and turn. Now how do I do that? I do whatever God tells me to do. And he gives us just two commands, very simple. Stand up before witnesses and tell them, I believe in, in the deity of Christ. John 8, 24. And then let someone immerse you. And there is that like figure whereunto baptism, not the water, but the very fact that at that moment God is going to work. Are you, do you have faith in the operation of God here? God goes to work, takes away your past sins, puts you into Christ, puts you into the church. He puts you into the place where God can justify you. You become the righteousness of God. Not in prospect as Abraham was, but in reality, you are now justified. I love what the old preachers used to preach at that point. I heard C.W. Bradley say it one day. He said, when I became a Christian, God looked at me, justified, never sinned. I like that. And so you become a Christian through the act, no, through the grace of God. The act simply puts you in the place to access His grace. We need to get past the idea that I heard from a lady one time. She called me on the phone and asked me if I would do her husband's funeral. Yes, ma'am, whatever you need. I said, is he a Christian? I, I didn't know him. I knew her. She was a member where I preached. I never had seen him. She said, well, he was baptized 25 years ago. I didn't ask her again, but I had a lot of thoughts about that. His baptism wasn't doing him any good, was it? Evidently, he never repented, really, or never understood what was happening. He didn't obey from the heart the pattern of teaching delivered him. He didn't have the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so he became, I don't know what you'd call him. But he certainly was not faithful. Here are a people to whom Noah's preaching. Brother Scott, do you remember the title of Noah's last sermon? I think I told you in class. That's it. Say it, Dan. That's my, that's it. Say it again. Did you all hear that? Who didn't hear that? How long can you tread water? That was his last sermon. Oh, what was wrong with these? <laughs> I want you to look at something at Genesis 7 1 with me quickly. Genesis 7 1. You know, I've got to get chapters 4 and 5 by the next two weeks, isn't it? I quit in here. Somebody read Genesis 7 1. Stop there a minute. Read it again and yell that word. Come. He didn't tell him to go into the ark, folks. If you're outside your house, you saw somebody come into the house, you're not in the house. Where was God when those folks started entering the ark? Come on. He's in the ark. I used to think everything was taken care of all that time. He doesn't leave us alone when we're his children. Can you imagine how frightened they would have been without God's presence? I love that sentence. Come into the ark. Well, he's telling us that tonight. Come into the church. That's a place of safety. Don't leave here tonight not a member of the church of Christ. You're in the wrong place. You're not in a place where God can bless you at all. And so before the flood, 
Noah preached and preached and preached and preached, and only seven people listened. Look at the end of the text now quickly, verse 22. This Christ, who was interested in the people, look at his preexistence here incidentally, interested in the people who lived before the flood, interested in us enough to die for them and us too, this resurrected one in whom I have every faith is gone into heaven. And right now he sits on the right hand of God and brothers and sisters, we're going to sit there too. Oh yes, he told us through the revelation, I'll make you sit with me in my Father's throne. Must be a big chair, Diana, but we're going to go there too. Where is God, where is Christ right now, folks? Where is he? Chicago, San Francisco, Beijing, where? Where is he? Then heaven ain't here. It's not on earth. It's there where he is. And notice, he has authority over everything in heaven and earth. That's what he said just before he left. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Angels, authorities, powers, those are the beings in heaven, are subject unto him. Not just the church. He's over any, everybody. Next time you hear someone say, well, I'm not under Christ, I'm not in the church. Well, you are under Christ, whether you're in the church or not. He that rejects me and receives not my word has one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day, John 12, 48. Thank you very much for your kind attention tonight. Let's quit.